Welcome back to our beautiful view here above Washington, D.C. A part-time job is a great way to earn extra money, but a new study suggests there may be some unforeseen dangers. Here's Alexander Marquardt with a closer look. If you're still looking for a New Year's resolution, we might have one for you, but be warned, it won't be easy. Callie Carlin has a story. Next, we get to the rest of the day's top news, and later we hear from many of you about the impact Martin Luther King has had on your lives. Most Americans can say whether they're Irish, Chinese, Brazilian, or Egyptian. That's because most Americans know where their family tree is rooted. Yet for 40 million African Americans, their ancestry is a mystery. But DNA testing is tracing roots into the heart of Africa. Let's talk about a topic that's on the minds of so many Americans right now, Iraq. Yeah. Uh, how do you answer critics of the war in Iraq, um, especially now that so many members of the president's own party are coming out saying that they don't support this overall strategy? I'm not sure that you've got that much disagreement really on the strategy. Look, nobody likes war. I I'm a little surprised sometimes when I look at polls that we don't get a 100% answer, do you want out now? Uh, of course you do. So th the fact is that you're in a war, which is always a tough thing. But on the other hand, the consequences of failure in Iraq are going to be absolutely catastrophic for this country and its people. So you got to do the right thing. It's interesting because if you ask people a different question, which is, do you want to win? They say yes. So I think what you have are a lot of people who acknowledge that they don't like war. But on the other hand, you got to find a way to win it. And that's what the president's trying to do. Is the president at all concerned as he's nearing the end of his presidency that he may have to leave and the war is unresolved? Well, two things. First, we've got a quarter of the presidency left, so there's still a fair amount to go. We've got a couple of years. Secondly, the process of having a firm and successful democracy in Iraq is going to take longer than this presidency. So we're under no illusions. Some of this is going to be handed off to the next White House. I asked Tony whether the administration considers Iran a threat or a partner. Neither. We've laid out an offer where they can basically get everything they want. They want civilian nuclear power, they can get it. But what we don't want them to have is the ability to have a nuclear weapon. This is a meeting about Iraq. Iran's Iraq's neighbor. So you, you expect that the Iranians, uh, at least we hope that they're going to play a constructive role in helping the, Ira the Iraqi government stand up. I dropped out of public school because I didn't feel like it was a safe environment for me. I dropped out of school because I got lazy and then just stopped going. I was discouraged from a lot of things going on in my life and I kind of gave up on myself. Many obstacles got in the way of me attending school. Marquita Poindexter lives on her own in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. This is my living room. Mm -hmm. She dropped out of high school a year ago. At that time, I was still 17, and I just, like, I dropped out, started working two jobs to kind of save up a little money. Marquita found herself trying to make ends meet at fast food joints and neighborhood stores. But the path that led her out of school to life on her own wasn't created overnight. Well, my whole childhood was really screwed up. It was horrible. Um, my mom committed suicide when I was three years old. Um, when I was two, my dad got sentenced to life. Marquita's father is serving a life sentence in prison for murder. The night I was there, I he called from jail. Huh? Oh, Dad, can we not get into there like you're going to make me cry? <laughs> With a tough home life, Marquita and her siblings bounced between different homes and schools. Unfortunately, some of the credits got lost. I wasn't receiving credits at some places or whatever. So it was just at one point in time, like, I'm just too old to just start all over again. Edward De Jesus, a community advocate in Washington, D.C., says he hears stories from young people like Marquita every day. So many of them left school for so many different reasons. And the majority of them leave for reasons of things outside of their uh, control. Research shows the dropout crisis isn't just affecting teens in big cities. According to one recent study, South Carolina, Georgia, Tennessee, and Alabama have the lowest graduation rates. Nationwide, nearly one out of every three high school students don't graduate. 325 miles west of Philadelphia, in the small farm community of Fairmont, West Virginia, I met 17-year-old Dustin Stewart. 
When did your parents first start to notice that something was wrong? When every report card I got was straight F. <laughs> All my friends were getting their homework done and doing what they needed to do, and I was like kind of getting left behind. It made me feel a little out of place because I didn't really know what I was doing. What'd you do when you felt that way? I just kind of cocked an attitude with everybody and didn't really pay attention at all to anything. Dustin dropped out of high school in January. Now that you're out of school, what are some of the things that you miss? I mostly just miss my friends and stuff we did in high school, like we, the dances and the parties and stuff like it. When we went back to Dustin's old high school, he told me how <laughs> things have things changed. Do you still talk to any of your friends who, who are still in school? Not as much as I used to when I was in school, but I still talk to a couple of them, the ones that I live by. But other than that, no, I don't talk to any of them. Is that something you wish you could still have those relationships and still hang out with those guys? Yeah, I do wish I could still hang out with all my friends here in school. But I guess some things change when you drop out of school. The costs of dropping out aren't just social and academic. Tomorrow, Dustin and Marquita tell me the price they paid for their decision to leave school and where they are now. Would you Annalise Marie Frank was a Jewish girl born June 12, 1929 in Frankfurt, Germany. In 1933, Anne, her older sister Margot, and their parents, Edith and Otto, fled Germany for the Netherlands to stay ahead of Hitler's campaign against the Jews. The Frank family moved here to a third floor apartment at this address at 37 Meerwerderplan in Amsterdam. And in the summer of 1942, Otto Frank bought his daughter a diary for her 13th birthday at this bookstore just around the corner from their apartment. And it's here that Anne Frank's legacy really began. I hope I will be able to confide everything to you, and I hope you will be a great source of comfort and support. By Anne's 10th diary entry, Hitler's war machine reached the Frank's front door. To protect his family, Otto Frank moved them into his office building, which had a secret hiding place. Thursday, July 9th, 1942. Now our secret annex has truly become secret. A bookcase built in front of the entrance to our hiding place. It swings out on its hinges and opens like a door. Today that secret annex is part of a museum called the Anne Frank House. That's where I met Julia Sabro, who works there. Can you tell me where we are? We enter Anne's room. This room she shared with the dentist, Fritz Pfeffer. And, um, well, they argued quite a lot. Fritz Pfeiffer, whom Anne calls Mr. Dussel in her diary, was also in hiding with the Franks. It seems, I, I'm just amazed, I'm looking, it seems like such a small space for two people yes. to live for two years. I imagine it was a bed and another bed. Monday, June 15, 1942. I've got to know Yobi Dewal at the Jewish Secondary School. We are together a lot and she is now my best girlfriend. I met Yopi DeWall, whose real name is Jacqueline Sanders von Marsen. She read me the farewell letter Anne wrote to her from hiding. Dear Jacqueline, I'm writing you this letter to say goodbye. It will probably surprise you, but fate intends for it to be so. I have to leave your best friend, Anne. P.S. I hope that until we see each other again, we'll always be best friends. Bye-bye. Anne Frank would write just two more diary entries before August 4, 1944, when Anne and all those in the secret annex were discovered by the Nazis. On September 3rd, in a freight car much like this one, the Franks, the Von Dons, and Mr. Dussel were herded into the very last train out of Holland to Auschwitz, the infamous concentration camp in Poland. Within months, the Von Dons and Anne's mother were dead. Anne and her sister Margot were transported to Bergen-Belsen, a concentration camp in Germany. It's from there we bring you the conclusion of Anne's life and how her spirit lives on in the work of others. We'll bring you part two of our series tomorrow. To find out more, our look at Anne Frank's life continues on Channel One Livewire. For more video from inside her hideaway, just head to channel1.com. We'll be right back. <laughs>